Hang on this computer, let's see how it works. I have a power supply, so we should not run out of battery. Let's go. Okay, yeah, hi everyone. Um, thanks for making it. This is my dissertation defense. The title of it is, When Does a Bit Matter? Techniques for Verifying the Correctness of Assembly Languages and Floating Point Programs. And I'll kind of go through each of the three clauses of that um, as we go. So kind of the structure of this is I'll, I'll give a brief introduction to my motivation. I'll talk about some binary analysis work that I did at Sandia. And then the rest of the talk will be uh, floating point, talking about floating point. And I'll give a little bit of introduction uh, kind of along the way. It's not gonna be all the concepts at once. Um, so so that should uh, break things up a bit. So to frame my thesis a little bit, um, I've noticed as I was working that I enjoyed um, working either with no abstraction or lots of abstraction. And what I mean by that is a language, when you have a, a, something like an assembly language, you have complete control over what you want to do. So you can uh, write really optimized code. Um, but the problem with that is it's, it can be very hard to understand what's going on with code. Um, at the same time, uh, on the other side, I really enjoy working in domain specific languages. Like, uh, I, I don't know if MATLAB would be considered one, I would consider it domain specific because you get a lot of expressivity. Um, you can write uh, very, very expressive programs with a few lines of code. Um, I don't really care about Java, other people do, but it's not really for me. So um, I noticed a couple abstractions that were used that, that helped bridge between the assembly level and the MATLAB level of programming. And they work almost all the time, but when they didn't, uh, they were very hard to detect and fix these, these errors. Specifically, I'm referring to instruction set architectures, which I'll be calling ISAs, and floating point, um, floating point arithmetic. So we'll start, um, again, I, I say these words high level and low level. Um, and what I mean by that is it, kind of an, I'll just get, kind of give an intuitive definition. There's not really a formal definition, but the gist of high level is means you're using abstractions or you're not concerned with the underlying details of how a program's implemented. Um, that would be something like how the bytes are arranged or what precise floating point representation you're using to represent a real number. And again, low level would be the opposite. You do care about these things. So kind of framing this, this question of one of the key challenges of uh, verification of low level programs is that these abstractions that programmers use give insight into the nature of a program. That is, if you describe something in a type system or in a high level language, uh, you're, you're giving the computer some idea of what you want the program to do, right? I don't know if anyone's read some assembly, but it is often inscrutable. So now we're ready to um, sort of pose the question that I, I seek to answer in this dissertation. It is how can we apply high level reasoning techniques about computer programs to low level implementations? And, and I, this specifically has two parts. The first one is how can we write specifications of ISAs to enable static analysis? And the second part is, is about floating a point. We'll get to that next. So I'm gonna first talk about binary analysis. And this is my work um, at Sandia Labs with a few other authors, a couple of whom are here. So thanks for showing up. And it's, uh, the, the tool is called Quamelian. It's a lifter and intermediate language for binary analysis. So the motivation for Quamelian is that uh, we needed to analyze binaries on old and obscure ISAs. And um, this is the way the world works, right? The world runs on old and obscure hardware. Um, you might have remembered back when we were a bunch of uh, unemployment claims, right? We saw the extent to which we depended on old and obscure hardware. The, the thing about these, these things, these ISAs, is they're not supported typically by existing tools. At least that's what we found. Furthermore, there's not a machine readable specification. The notion of a machine readable specification of what an ISA is supposed to do is um, really only come about pretty recently. Um, and also dealing with these old ISAs, it, it was kind of the battle days of computing where a lot of things that we take for granted now did, were not standardized. So a bit a byte was not necessarily eight bits and there were no not one standard floating point. There were multiple floating point representations. So interoperability was a big concern. Now existing tools, that uh, other tools in the, in the area, uh, gain a lot of efficiency from having very expressive 
these very expressive ISAs, and they have some feature-rich intermediate languages that assume, for example, a byte is eight bits. Um, instead, we need something that's more adaptable that can handle basically any weird architecture we throw at it. And an ex uh, kind of a fun example is this one from DEF CON. Um, it was invented for a challenge at DEF CON, which had nine bit bytes, 27 bit words, and was middle endian. And if, uh, if you know much about ISAs, that sounds kind of silly, but it actually is um, more realistic than you might think. There are some things, there are some reasons why, architectural reasons why you might have strange byte orderings. So I'll start to talk about the architecture of Quamelian, and this uh, we'll go through these phases in detail by color, um, starting with its intermediate language. This recall I was talking about the adaptable IL. I'm just checking. The, okay, um, no chat. All right, and so some of the design goals of the Quamelian intermediate language, which we call Quill, is uh, the main goal is sound analysis of binaries. And I'll be mentioning soundness throughout um, this, this talk. And, and essentially what it's meaning is that uh, there's some very nice properties you get when you have a sound analysis, but essentially this means you have no false positives or, or um, we'll contrast this with like a linter or something where it might give you a warning, which is spurious, right? Um, and so the goal of this, of Quill is to, uh, of Quamelian is to lift binaries into a simple IL um, that can be used for multiple in, uh, analysis backends. So this is kind of the same design goal of LLVM, the LLVM compiler and its intermediate representation is it can support multiple architectures. We don't wanna be able to support multiple different um, static analysis analyses. Now the size of Quill is about 60 instructions means it's, it's easy to manipulate, um, but again, we lose this expressivity. So it's harder to write uh, programs in Quill. The way we balance this is we use uh, a higher level language, like uh, we use Haskell as a macro assembler kind uh, to Quill. And I'll show an example of this shortly. So a little bit more about Quill is um, it, it's a static a single assignment language like many compiler ILs. And uh, a, a program consists of a sequence of blocks which are single entry, multiple exit. That's not too crazy. Um, one kind of important, uh, in, innovation that uh, more modern languages use that we are using is that uh, we have a lightweight dependent type that uh, keeps track of the bit vector width. And this helps uh, catch a lot of bugs in the specification and make sure we're writing correct code that we have the right uh, size bit width. There's also a, a reading and writing um, to locations like RAM and register. And then uh, the behavior of a program is determined by its sequence of reads and writes. Okay, so now that's a very brief overview of Quill. I won't show any Quill because it's sort of, it's a little bit messy of code to fit on a single slide. Um, but now I'll talk about the, the domain specific language uh, in Haskell. Uh, we'll call that a DSL from here, here on out. Um, and you use this DSL to specify a, a different, you know, another assembly language, like, like I use in this example, the Motorola 6800, which is an ISA from 1974, I believe. So here's some, some code in, in a pseudo Motorola 6800 um, language. And it, it simply is loading a value into a register and performing a bitwise and operation to with, with A and the location in memory. Um, so we want to match the manual precisely what this says. And this is what I did over the summer. When the summer I read uh, this very old manual and, and uh, translated it into a machine readable Haskell. And, and this is what, uh, for example, the and operation looks like. And uh, don't worry too much about the details. Let me see if I can uh, annotate this. Um, so, so we're, we're reading a, a location um, of RAM. This is what we're called, uh, this loading in. We're getting a register. And then we're uh, performing the bitwise and, and then we're writing some condition codes, uh, which is just some status registers. And then we're branching to next. So it's, it's pretty simple. Um, let's see, clear drawings. Okay, <laughs> there we go, where'd it go? Oh, it's on the wrong side. Okay, there we go, clear. All right. And I don't wanna annotate anymore. Well, that didn't work. Okay, uh, we're back. All right, so um, now I'll talk about the backends and 
Now in bold, there's really, we, we've implemented two. Um, so these are all the things that we, we kind of have planned, but I'll, I'll talk about the two. And the first one is an emulator, which really just runs the program. Um, this is more useful than it might seem at first, because uh, as one might imagine for a very old architecture, uh, it might be hard to get a hold of such a computer, or even if you can, to, to connect it with uh, your current computers, right? Um, this, a lot of these are before um, ethernet or internet was a standard. So it can be, you can't have, you can't SSH into them or something, right? Another one, uh, another backend was this bridge to a tool called Anger, uh, which is a symbolic execution engine. It's primarily designed for cybersecurity purposes, but a lot of great research has come out of it. So it's a very mature tool. Um, and we treat Quill as an ISA that Anger can execute, um, which uh, that way we gain all the power of Anger um, uh, through Quill. Now there's some, some architectural considerations to deal with that, but uh, that was mostly implemented by Tristan at Sandia. Um, so thanks for that. And last, I'll mention some optimizations of, uh, of Quamelium. And so these are a little bit different than optimizations we might think of in compilers. Typically, when you have an optimization, you want to either um, inc increase runtime or decrease memory usage or some, something like that. Instead, we really only care about how easy the code is to optimize. So oftentimes, this results in, in, in uh, reducing code size uh, to make fewer instructions to, to analyze. But also, it would mean simplifying the control flow graph, which might in, case, might in some cases increase the code size. So it's a very different, uh, interesting search space to, to the optimizations we want to do. So we just do a few here, a um, few, few sort of straightforward ones. Um, and, and then, so, so that was, uh, that was a, 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 the talk about Quamelian. And going back to our dissertation question, um, my dissertation question, so that, that answered the first part of how can we write specifications of instruction set architectures to enable static analysis? Well, we did this with a Haskell domain specific language um, with lightweight dependent types and uh, an expressible, or rather not an expressible, an extensible IL, a flexible IL that we can translate um, assembly language into. So now the rest of this talk will be about um, floating point. So get ready. The first uh, part is the title is called a statistical analysis of error in MPI reduction operations. And don't worry, I'll, I'll explain all the all the words. So this is work previously published with uh, Boyana and me uh, at uh, Correctness Workshop. Now I'll, I'll give a, a brief introduction to floating point. Um, it, here's a couple examples of you know floating point mostly works, but sometimes it doesn't. Uh, the top one is a little bit more expensive. These are both financial, I guess. Um, a rocket exploded because uh, of, a, of a conversion, an, an overflow from a 64-bit float to a 16-bit integer. So that's something we want to avoid. Um, we also want to avoid getting um, not a number of tax returns. That's just another uh, picture I found on Twitter. Um, and, and it kind of points to um, the, the strangeness of floating point. So there's a few reasons. I'm going to make this claim is that we don't trust floating point. Um, and, and there's a few good reasons for it. It's a little bit bold, but, but uh, hopefully it'll become clear shortly. Um, the first one is, is it doesn't map perfectly to real numbers. It never can because the real numbers are an uncountable set and the floating point are finite. Um, other issues is you can't in binary floating point, which is what the majority of architectures run. You can't represent one tenth uh, exactly. There's some error. Um, and they're also, I guess, more importantly, what I'll be focusing on is that the, the complex um, behavior of error and exceptions. And that's, that's kind of the, the, the stuff we want to look at here, is how does error interact as, and propagate as uh, you, you execute your program. But despite all this, um, it, it's what we're stuck with, right? There's a lot of momentum, a lot of work has gone into floating point. Um, and so this is the, the kind of, uh, you know, this is how the world works, how it is. And to the right, I have a, I know it's a little bit dated, but this is a, a COVID-19 spike protein. And um, this was modeled in a, in a computer, uh, the, the, the proposed structure of the spike protein. Um, and and I, I bring this up because um, I, I sort of make another bold claim is that um, like high performance computing and a lot of numerical codes lag behind in scientific rigor of the empirical sciences like biology. Um, because in every experiment, um, with biology, the, you have this sort of measurement error and you're very aware of the error that could potentially could happen. Um, 
And this is not really the case in high performance computing. If you get an answer, you might have some notion based on the, the numerical method, but the actual floating point error is not tracked, kept track of. And I, I kind of hope that we get to a point where we can express error um, with a, with a comp along with a computation. That way we can actually begin to trust these com computer models because at this point, um, biologists, uh, the biologists I've talked to has, have said that uh, floating point is our computer simulation is a great search space, but then things actually need to be um, you know, made in the lab or, or done in, in, in the wet lab to actually uh, be real in some sense. So hopefully this work is the step towards changing that. But anyway, I wanna, let's, let's go down in the weeds a little more. Um, floating point arithmetic is not associative. And what I mean by that is uh, let, let's take this um, floating point, this circled plus, and I'll use a circled throughout this presentation to mean a, a floating point operation where the plus is the real number operation. Um, and so we get two different answers depending on how we parenthesize um, this number. It's just 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 plus 0 0.3. And so going back to, um, does a bit matter, right? When does a bit matter? Well, uh, this one probably doesn't. It's just one off. It's pr probably close enough. However, um, that's something we want to keep track of, or we, we want we want to uh, measure more carefully. Is uh, deciding when, at what point, do uh, does the error start to matter and start to become significant? Because in some cases, yes, it's only one bit off, but in some cases, the error can accumulate. And this uh, this this issue gets worse, right? There's only one bit off here, but when the magnitudes of the of the operands are much different, that we we see a lot more error. So again, more, more talk about error. I'm going to bring up uh, absolute versus relative error and just, just quickly define those because I'll be using these throughout. So let's, uh, let's let x hat be an approximation for some uh, floating point approximation for some real number x. Then the relative error is, uh, is that equation. And, it's, and the absolute error is, is, uh, is just the diff absolute difference between the two. Um, pr pretty straightforward, but to give you some intuition on this, uh, I think of absolute error like a, like a financial calculation, right? It doesn't matter how many uh, shares of a stock you buy, you will always, uh, it will always be rounded to the nearest one-tenth of a cent, whether you're buying one penny's worth of stocks or $100,000 or something. Um, and that's called a mill, but yeah, that's typically what financial calculations are rounded to. And then we can think of relative error. It's, it tends to be slightly more informative, um, but it is not defined for... Uh, X is zero, right? Because we get this division by zero. Um, but I think of relative error, like I think of the number of significant di uh, digits. You, and you can keep track of that throughout a computation um, because as you, as you scale these, you still have the same number of significant digits. So uh, again, this is, this is a very common model for uh, error of a floating point. Like I mentioned before, the actual error of a floating point operation, and sometimes I'll refer to that as a, as a flop, um, a floating point operation is, is very complicated, but uh, we simplify it by uh, equation one there. So essentially we can think of the, the dot is some real number operation, you know, add, subtract, divide, multiply. And the circle dot is its floating point operation. And we have some error here, E, which is, it turns out to be relative error, the, the algebra works out. And uh, we have this, the absolute value of E is less than some epsilon. Now you might've heard this term machine epsilon. This is what th that's referring to. Um, for double precision, epsilon is two to the minus 53 or about a little more than 15 digits, um, two to the minus 15, or sorry, 10 to the minus 15. Um, the thing about this is it's a pretty good model, um, but, but it only holds for uh, non-zero. I mean, typically the zero, the error is either undefined or it is zero. So it's a special case, but something to keep in mind. And also it only holds for normal numbers. And what I mean by normal numbers is uh, numbers that are very close, uh, subnormal numbers are numbers which are very close to zero. Um, so either very, very small, positive, very, very small, negative. And so we'll talk more about subnormal numbers uh, soon, but, but for now, just, just keep that in mind. And yet another definition, uh, again, this, I kind of broke up the introduction into two parts, so, so this is heavy introduction. I'll, I'm going to talk about message passing interface, or MPI. And uh, again, this is another part of the title, so we're, we're working through the title still. Um, and it's an API for communication between computers, specifically parallel computers. 
Um, it is the de facto standard for high performance computing. Now it has been described as uh, both too high level and too low level. So that's great for me, as I mentioned, framing my talk. Um, it's high level and it's low level. The reason for this is it has some strange, uh, maybe not strange, but it has some abstractions which are above the level of a, of a programming language it, you typically write in like C, C++, Fortran. And it has some abstractions which are lower level. Um, and so here's one which is, which is uh, higher level. And, and so we're gonna be focus, focusing on reduction algorithms. What I mean by that is you take a single val you take an array of values and you reduce it to a single value. Uh, think just adding up numbers in a, in a list or an array uh, via MPI sum. And the way this works is you distribute uh, the array across all the MPI ranks, which are processes. And you, then you um, work your way up in time and you communicate between the processes and you uh, add the numbers up or do whatever operation. And you're end, you end with a single value. Um, now, there is an unspecified, but uh, usually deterministic reduction order. What I mean by that is if you have a, the same topology and the same input, right? Running on the same computer, one can imagine, you will get the same answer. And uh, this is not something that would happen automatically, right? Uh, th this is because of a lot of hard work of MPI developers. It is not part of the MPI standard, but it is recommended that you have this reproducibility. Um, however, if you run on different topology, there's no such guarantee. And, and in fact, there can probably never be such guarantee because, because we have this requirement for parallelism. So because we have non-determinism baked into the standard, it sort of makes sense to do a statistical analysis rather than a deterministic analysis. In the following chapter, I will do some deterministic analysis, but uh, we'll start with statistics. So then the question becomes, well, if we know there are many ways to do this reduce, well, how many? Um, and so th this is the start to, starting to get into my contributions. Be previously was just, uh, just set up. Um, and, and it depends, right? It depends on what we define a, an acceptable reduction strategy or way to add up the numbers. So I'm going to list four families and I'm not gonna go through them in a huge amount of, no, I'm pretty good on time. I, I can probably go through them all. Um, so the first one is canonical left associative. And this is basically the way you would do it uh, if, you, if you wrote it in serial. Um, we can see a loop here. Uh, you add up the numbers in a loop, increasing the incrementer or increasing the index. The nice thing about this is it's unambiguous. There's a single way to reduce the, um, the numbers this way, but you have no freedom to exploit parallelism because every single um, instruction depends on the previous one. So that's not good for a speed up perspective, but fortunately the MPI standard is flexible. So what it assumes is the operations are associative and commutative, or you can assume that they are just associative. If you want to do neither, you, you can't, you don't get any parallelism, right? Um, and, and as, as we, we recall, um, M, uh, floating point operations are not associative. So we have this, uh, this problem here where we are going to get different answers. Um, the question we, we kind of want to answer here is, is this worse? So um, I, I sort of made these three families. Uh, the first one is, is, and the first one as well, I don't want to say I, claim to invented adding up numbers. Um, now we have this, uh, the way I, I, I have these families is I have two things I do, right? I have uh, shuffling the array. So imagine that that messes with commutativity. And then I have generating a random reduction tree, which is associativity. So we have fixed and random um, ordering and associativity. So, uh, and I'll, I'll call these by their, uh, their acronyms for brevity like for Aurora, et cetera. And um, all of these have an, at least an exponential number of uh, associations or different, different results you can get. Um, and we generate these, we generate, so uh, generating the different orderings is pretty straightforward. We just shuffle the array, but uh, generating the um, different associations we do um, by just generating a random tree and, and having that be a reduction tree. Um, with Remy's procedure that, that, that has been known before. And so I wanna focus on um, the number three here, random order, random association, because that is the default. When you call MPI reduce, if you don't add any special flags, then that, that is what most of the, um, what, what most of the, the, the MPI code is running. 
So let, let's take an example summation and we can see that kind of the subtlety here. Right? If we, we can imagine these are our reduction trees, um, R1 is equal to R2 because floating point addition is commutative. And we can see this because you can flip around C and B, and then you can flip around the second height of the tree, um, you, you know, if you do that in your head. Um, but R2 is not equal to R3 because we don't have associativity. Um, again, I was not the first one to study summation error, but so, so there is this bound, um, a previous bound on absolute error. Um, so so let's, let's take this S sub A is the true sum and the, the sigma summation is the floating point sum. So we have some bound on the error, which depends on, we notice the machine epsilon here, N is the size of the array. And we have the, the magnitudes of, of the array. And so that's fine, but oftentimes this is really, really pessimistic in the sense of uh, your error will be predicted to be far worse. So there's kind of a lot going on on this, on this, uh, on this slide. So I'll explain it through um, each, each time. Um, and what we see this figure is a histogram. I wanted to show how pessimistic this is, right? And depending on how you reduce the numbers, what, what kind of results you might get. So um, we see this bound from two. Okay, so, so first off, this is a histogram, right? So the y-axis is the number of experiments that are binned there. And the, um, I ran this 2 million times on an input of size 50,000. And so we have a random, random order, random associativity versus left associativity. So you're shuffling the array in both cases and uh, you're doing random association or, or you're not. And a few things to notice. Oh, oh, and I took for the true answer, I just uh, ran to, uh, the experiment with a, a thousand digit float. So that's close enough, right? It's a thousand digits versus 15 or 16. Um, a few things we notice here. First one is the, the, if you just shuffle the array and add them up, left associative, you have this bias sum. And the reason you're getting this is because um, you have a uniform distribution of all positive numbers. You see that in the bottom right, uniform zero one. So, so what, what this means is as you're adding up these numbers in a, uh, uh, you have an accumulator, which is getting larger and larger, and you're having this um, small number added to it. So you're, you're essentially, you can lose some bits. Um, so, you know, this might matter, this might not. Uh, I, I will leave that up to the application designer, but I want to make this uh, very clear to people who are doing parallel operations. And so another thing we notice is uh, the bound from two, we have it's four to the negative, 10 to the negative four, roughly. So this is five orders of magnitude greater than uh, even the canonical left associative. So we have this canonical left associative is that blue line, um, it's much, much worse. And it's even more, I'm not exactly sure of many orders of magnitude. I think it's six or seven orders of magnitude from the Aurora uh, summation. Um, another thing to note is even the worst case that I found of, of the 50,000 cases has a smaller error than canonical. So what this means, the takeaway from this is that MPI summation actually in many cases can be better than um, running the code in serial. Um, it's kind of a, it's not, it, it, it can be counterintuitive, but, but that was the, the result I got. All right, and, and so great, I have the result for, um, you know, any, I have the result for, for some theoretical thing and adding up random numbers, but the world we work in is not just random numbers. Um, so I wanted to have some real world examples. And the key takeaway here, I don't, I don't want to get into it in too much detail, but the key takeaway is that there's not that many different results. Um, we're, we're getting a surprising amount of consistency. So what I did here is I ran a, a computational fluid dynamics proxy app called Neckbone, and we looked at the residual of the conjugate gradient in one step. So basically, um, I took the default as baseline, and then I took, subtracted the difference for, for all these. Um, the main thing is here is there's only four different answers, and they're very close, except for one outlier, which... Uh, We'll, we'll, we still need to investigate. Um, but uh, we'll notice this little, this little line here on the top of the, of the graph is the gap between doubles. And we notice it's, that means there's only about five or six double precision. This is about as, as close as we can get, right? We're only like three bits off. Um, and so that, that sort of interesting result is, is just how well the MPI library designers look at. Um, but but this, this prompts um, more work to look at uh, for, more, for different applications, like it, how does the error change? Like what is the space? Um, we looked at the state space kind of theoretically, 
with uh, this previous result, but now we want to look for uh, more work is to look into this uh, in more detail. Oh, and we use uh, a tool called SimGrid, which allows us to emulate or rather simulate um, a various different MPI uh, implementations and topologies because I ran this uh, on 16 different. I didn't want to, did not want to install 16 different uh, uh, MPI implementations. So I'm very happy SimGrid exists to let me uh, do this experiment. All right, so that started to answer the uh, second part of my dissertation question. How can we formalize and quantify the error from floating point arithmetic in high performance numerical programs? But it's not quite done yet, right? I looked at summation um, and Summation does not a numerical algorithm make. So we would like to look at something a little bit more sophisticated um, in, 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 instead of just adding up numbers. This brings me to the next work, uh, next chapter, which is scalable error analysis for floating point program optimization. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna preface this again, uh, we'll start with a little, little digression, but we'll see this has its, has its import. More challenges of floating point, right? Um, suppose we want a floating point division. Now I, I do this all the time, not all the time, but I do this sometimes in Excel, you might divide by zero and you don't want to not a number or something. So I'll have a, a statement such, such, such as this. If it's, uh, you want a safe divide, this returns a finite value for all inputs. And maybe that's sometimes that's well-defined. So let's suppose it is. Um, seems easy, you just check for zero. You can't divide by zero, return zero, otherwise you divide. Um, that's not the case. Floating point is more difficult than that. Um, and this is how you do it truly safe. And I figured this out. I, I don't know. I don't know if such an implementation exists elsewhere. Um, you have to check for not a number. You have to check for infinity, but you also have to check for these, these small numbers here. And this is, uh, I've cast it to an integer. So don't worry too much about the representation, but just keep in mind that these are, right. These are the bits <laughs> that matter. Uh, and I figured this out with an exhaustive search. So this is per all and only the numbers that result in uh, infinite when you try to divide by zero. Otherwise you do division. So this was not easy. Uh, to, uh, it's not straightforward rather. Um, so there's a lot of subtlety here. And I wanna talk about how uh, existing tools used to handle this, this uh, static error analysis. And also I realized I never defined static. When I say static, I mean experimentation without executing the program. It's kind of what this was with what this dissertation focuses on is um, getting information before you run the program. So there are tools. Um, some of them are FP Taylor, Satire, Daisy. I will focus on FP Taylor. That is the tool I, I, I use in this in this area. And they are kind of all work the same. They take as input a domain specific language where you express some floating point program. You give the range of the input. Um, and that's another, another very important thing because the range has a huge impact. Uh, we saw with floating point division, if you know the range is greater than one, you don't have to worry, uh, right? And then you output um, the maximum possible error. That's, that what, that's what it returns. And it's found with a global optimization, at least in FP Taylor's case. So this is, uh, this is great because we know this is the worst error can ever be given some the ranges in the floating point program. Uh, there are a couple drawbacks. The first one is uh, these tools do not currently support loops or conditionals. So you're just writing straight line code, which uh, will get you further than you might think if you're clever, but, even, but, but, but a more fundamental problem is that it's slow. And when I say slow, I mean, it takes about an hour and a half to uh, analyze a, a code which contains 500 floating point ops, flops. Um, and mostly these are sound. So again, I mentioned soundness as a, as a key, kind of a key goal here. Um, you get an, a lot of theoretical benefits if you do a sound static analysis, which is uh, oftentimes, or the, which is oftentimes called abstract interpretation. So I want to talk about soundness and, and why we should care. Um, it's because if you under approximate the error, that might be much worse than over approximating. For example, here, if you, um, ha if your truck is 11 foot eight inches and one quarter, um, and you under approximate it to 11 foot eight, you might hit a bridge, which is actually 11 foot eight. Um, whereas if you over approximate how tall your truck is, oh, say it's 11 foot nine inches, uh, you might just waste a little gas, right? So this, in these cases where we have highly asymmetric cost functions, um, th these things are important. And this is not just like a theoretical consideration. This is something people actually look at, for example, to make sure planes don't collide, right? You want to um, steer away um, when, you, when you think you might collide. 
Okay, so let's move back to subnormal numbers. Um, you haven't escaped yet. So we saw in, I, I, don't, I don't think I, I think it was equation one, but I didn't equation number this one. Um, I'll, I'll bring it up here. We have, remember I said this, this, uh, this model of floating point error was pretty good. Well, um, it's not great because if you have subnormal numbers, um, or rather it's a very good error. Okay, so the previous equation was a very good uh, model for error, but it, it is not sound in the case that if you have very, very small numbers, you might under approximate error. So the way we fix this is we have a small term there bounded by delta. The, it's, uh, it's D and the absolute value of D for double precision is less than two to the negative 174, 1074, which is much smaller than the epsilon, which if we recall is two to the negative 53. But even so, we are carrying about large number of float flops where this error might accumulate. So we want to keep track of these things. Um, and I want to give a little bit more motivation of this. Um, so we said, great, adding up numbers is not interesting. So let, let's talk about a, a, another slightly more complicated operation. So we want to um, normalize this vector. And the way we do this is we, we take, uh, take the length of the vector and we divide every element in the vector by its length. Um, the way this is done in practice is uh, we do one divided by the square root of x dot x, right? And so what we see here is we see the summation in the, uh, the dot product. And we see a division in a square root. Um, so, so that's just sort of the motivation. And this is kind of the, this is one of the, the improvements I made. Uh, there was an existing bound, which uh, existed by, it was done by Nicholas Hyam. Um, and it's unsound, but it is uh, simpler. So don't worry too much about the details. The, the main thing to keep in mind is we see this N times delta term, and that is how you make it sound. Um, of course, just as a, as a little aside, we can make this sound by saying the error is always infinity, right? Uh, but that's not a useful bound. So we, what we want to do is we want to have a sound bound that is as tight as possible around this error. So um, this one is, is pretty good, I think. Um, but yeah, OK, so, so we see this N times delta term. Now that, now that we have that, that bound, um, I, I want to talk about kind of, sort of the key insight uh, of, of this chapter. And the key insight is that we can combine this global search for the hard parts and the, compute this bounds for the, for the majority of flops. Let me, let me explain that a little bit further, right? So we have this equation here. It doesn't matter, right? We see the n here and we have the, the lengths of the x and the y. Um, this is very scalable in the sense of, uh, I can just plug this into a computer and it will spit out an answer in constant time. Um, if we have some reasonable bound on the X and the Y, which again, we are assumed to have for these static analysis bound, uh, tools. So this is scalable. It doesn't take very long. So, I, I, so one of the, the results I'm really happy with here is that uh, you know, F, FP Taylor takes about 55,000 seconds to analyze 500 flops. But then if we use FP Taylor for the hard parts, which I'm defining as the division in square root, and uh, you know this bound I, I worked, I, I developed, I refined for the, the easy parts, which is the dot product. We get, um, you know, it, it takes uh, it takes ten seconds to do uh, a billion flops to analyze a billion flops. So that's a speed up of ten to the eleven orders of magnitude. So I'm pretty happy with that. Um, but the next step uh, in, in kind of the future work is to compare this with empirical error. Like, what does this actually look like? Right? We have this uh, theoretical bound, but uh, how does this look empirically? Um, but one other thing I want to mention is, is this uh, reciprocal square root, right? We saw this in the vector normalization. And so if we're, doing, um, if we're doing reciprocal square root on a vector of size a billion, it, we want to get the accurate result because it doesn't matter if it takes uh, 10 computer cycles or 50 or even 200 uh, because the, the dominating cost is this dot product of a billion elements. But there are many cases where you are normalizing small vectors all over the place. One example would be in computer graphics. There's also some data uh, like clustering uh, algorithms that might use us on, on a smaller um, subset of, of results. So in this case, it might be uh, worth it to analyze um, the numerical side of things. And this is, this is kind of what I, I, I want to develop further. And I'll, I'll talk about this a bit in my future work. But what I started with is looking at uh, how a Taylor series, uh, which is typically how these uh, reciprocal square roots are approximated if you don't have the, the hardware for it, um, how they're done 
And we see this, this, this is sort of this, this blending of floating point error analysis and numerical analysis, because the numerical analysis gives some bound on uh, how the, the speed of convergence of, of some Taylor series, depending on your initial guess. So uh, the initial guess, it, it, it starts, um, or rather the inverse square root is on the x-axis and the relative error is on the y-axis. And so as we see the, the graph gets, gets lighter, we see the error decreasing as it should because the Newton's iter method will converge. But the main kind of takeaway here is that input range and quality of initial guess have a large effect on convergence. Because as we get to the more iterations, this is more expensive for flops. So we want to have this trade-off, right? And you can't, you know, at a certain point, you can't improve. You notice this epsilon line. You can't really get better than that um, because you don't have any more bits to, to describe this. So that's a, a last little, little contribution I had is this sort, sort of starting to explore this space of this performance accuracy trade-off. Okay, so, so that's kind of the, the that, that wraps up the content slides and I'll talk a bit, uh, I'll conclude and, and talk about some future research directions. Um, well, the question is, did I answer the question? <laughs> My dissertation question. Um, so, so I talked about uh, specifications of ISAs with, uh, with Quamelian, which is a tool for binary analysis. And that, that enables uh, static analysis uh, through, um, through leveraging anger and, uh, and we, using the uh, domain specific language we developed um, to express uh, both programs and, uh, you know, and ISAs. And then I started to look at uh, formalizing and quantifying the error from floating point arithmetic. I kind of looked at this two ways. I looked at this in a probabilistic sense or rather a statistical sense um, with, with um, MPI reduction. And then I looked at this in a um, deterministic sense by kind of by refining some error bounds um, and refining some error bounds and then looking at this uh, numerical analysis sort of floating point in the, in the, in the intersection of the two. So I want to talk about some future research directions because I think this, this dissertation opens up a lot of interesting areas. First one is binary analysis. Um, we saw a Quamulian, which is great for specifying um, very, very obscure architectures. And, and uh, we want to extend this further because now th there's been a, 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 not a resurgence, but there's been more open source um, hardware. So one example is RISC-V, but I believe there's some proprietary ones that were closed source and then became open source. And what these do is they allow a huge amount of research to happen because you can, anybody can download the hardware and the specification and work with it. Um, so there was a project out of Cambridge called SAIL, which is now the actual, um, it is the official specification. And it is a computer, it's a completely machine checkable specification of an ISA. Well, this is great because we can get a lot of error checking. We can get a lot of correctness, strong correctness arguments for RISC-V. So uh, work I wanna look at is uh, connecting Quamelian with, um, with SAIL because with SAIL you can, just, you can have uh, proof obligations in a language like Coke um, and, and that could have very, very strong guarantees. And we can use our work with older obscure architectures and hopefully connect it with SAIL. The next uh, project I want to talk about is, uh, is, is the emerging field of formal numerical methods. And uh, I, 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 I would say I coined this term. I, I Googled it. There's no such uh, field, but I hope it becomes a, an area. So if, if, if you see it uh, some years later, it uh, started with me. And the, the kind of the, 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 the key insight is, well, one of the things I want to look at, I would say the key insight for formal numerical methods is blending um, numerical analysis with floating point error analysis. And this has been done before, but never called this. But what I want to look at is a blend of probabilistic and deterministic error analysis, because there are some cases where probabilistic error analysis is good. Uh, as we saw before with MPI, you can scale to a large number of operations and it, it tends to be more realistic, right? We saw this uh, work that, that showed it was five or six orders of magnitude tighter bound um, compared to a, a, like an analytical or theoretical bound. The problem with this is, is, is the probabilistic analysis is not sound. Um, so we want to look at, uh, we, we need to use deterministic error analysis in some cases, but I think there can be a blend of this, um, right? We have non-determinism inherent in MPI. Uh, so I want to look at uh, how these, these two interact. And another thing, and I'm a little short on time, so I won't get to go into my example, but um, 
pre-computation. And what I mean by this is also called partial evaluation. Um, back in the, uh, I don't know, the 80s, it was worth it because computers and uh, cycles and memory were so expensive. It was worth it to spend a, a huge amount of human time to um, pre-compute something. Let's take, for example, a lookup table. You, you compute the values and then you uh, use them later. But uh, this, this sort of, we're kind of back, back, back to the same circle because uh, computers, you know, being in every single cell phone and all over requiring very low power or, or all sorts of uh, uh, places, we have computers. Um, it, it's now worth it because of the ubiquity to spend a lot of time again to do pre-computation or do partial evaluation. And this is, um, you know, one really interesting area I want to look into is there was this uh, paper this year at Popple uh, with a project called RLibM, and they use this in more intelligent search space to uh, find a both faster and more accurate math library. So a lot of this, there's this kind of belief that, uh, you know, these things have been so heavily optimized that um, there's no improvement that can be made, but uh, this is not true. And I, I just want to, um, I'll conclude, but I just want to show this, uh, this slide here just, just because it, this is a very an interesting function to me. It's actually on my wall right over there. Um, but this sort of thing, this is like sort of a hack. Um, we can improve on this, right? By, by, by uh, doing some intelligent search space. Okay, so I kind of concluded already, but um, you know, I, the, the key takeaways are verification of low level programs are challenging because you throw away this information that you reason about the program. Um, my techniques rely on detailed mathematical models and speed of modern computers that, to help people write correct fast code. So that'll, that will conclude the dissertation or my defense. And you could find my research at that website for this foreseeable future. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Sam.